The other thing to consider is the fact that the type of Islam which Iran uh, preaches. I remember talking with Walid Shoba, who was a, 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 a yeah, I know who that is. Yeah. yeah, I had a conversation with him, and um, th that brand of Islam awaits uh, uh, somebody called the the Mahdi, which is basically the Messiah, it's like the thirteenth right. yeah. Imam, but. According to their belief, that 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 Mahdi, that 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 thirteenth Imam, will not appear until there is basically an an apocalypse. So they yeah. are looking. For, they're actually looking forward. They want to start World War Three. They right. actually want. Yeah. <laughs> they are actually looking forward to uh, a, a grand apocalypse because sure. um, that. According to their belief, is when uh, their their Mahdi, their uh, Islamic Messiah, will will right. Uh, right. appear. Yeah, scary. It, it's 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 really scary. It really is. So, um, anyhow, um, let's see. I think I've got all of my buttons punched here to to get started tonight. And uh, there you go. All right. Yeah, I'd gotten, uh, like I said, I'd gotten several, for those of you welcome in tonight, I've gotten some correspondence from friends over in, in Israel and that uh, uh, <clears throat> looking at the uh, the after action report, uh, it was nothing short of a, a modern day uh, miracle of God that, uh, that, you know, that they were able to shoot down over 99 percent of everything that came in that's just unheard of and so uh just have to keep upholding them in prayer and uh, i know that we did yesterday morning starting our worship service off with a, a special prayer for israel and uh um you know everyone needs to be doing that so, because it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be rough for them for a while and we did that for you for friday too yeah we did we did of course for me that's an everyday thing so <laughs> you know i can do it uh, um, uh corporately with people but uh, for me it's also an everyday thing so all right so good uh good deal uh good to have you with us tonight jerry yeah haven't seen you on on the Sunday night thing for a while. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you. Had uh, saw uh, Greg yesterday. Uh, okay. To our our lunch we had, and it really went well. Thank you. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Um, okay. Well, let's go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. You know the rules. I mute you, but if you have something to say, you just unmute yourself and say away. So everybody is muted now, and uh, I think I've got all of my buttons pushed that I need to to push, and we're going to go ahead um, with with the class tonight. Uh, start with the blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kedushanu B'Mitzvotah V'Tzivano Lasok B'Divrei Torah. Bless you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, sanctifies us with His commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. All right, um, so tonight we're doing Hebrews 4, and I've titled it a, a, a Sabbath Rest for God's People. And so are there any comments or questions um, from anyone, uh, you know, about what we covered last week or um, or whatever, um, or if you have a question about what's going on? With this, just uh, jump in there, and uh, we'll get going. Uh, start off with uh, verse number one. Um, let's see, four one. Let us fear then, though a promise of entering the rest is left open. Some of you would seem to have fallen short. All right, now this um, the idea of a of a rest is is misunderstood in a lot of uh theological discussions today i think that typically 
you see it in the uh, in the Christian world when they're talking about uh, the rest and the Messiah and the rest of God and so forth and so on. It's spoken of in a uh, more of a, um, a in an eschatological view or an end time view that the rest will not come until well either we die. Uh, or when uh, Yeshua returns at the uh, at the beginning of the millennium, and uh, the rest though that we have as believers is more than just a spiritual promise that's to be realized, you know, sometime in the future. And so uh, uh, there is actually a genuine physical rest to be enjoyed by those who follow the Lord and His commandments. And uh, I don't know. I can I can tell you that uh, when we uh, for me, for quite a few years, uh, you know, we uh, were in the Messianic uh, synagogue uh, on Shabbat, and then we also were in a Christian church on Sundays because I uh, I was still involved in in the music aspect of you know they're one of their musicians and. And uh, Pat was uh, was co-teaching the um, the um, adult Sunday school class, and so we stayed with that for uh, for a while. But um, once we devoted ourselves to a Shabbat rest, and and even that's kind of tough because uh, for me, Shabbat is the busiest day of the of the week. That's when I, I get up at uh, 5, 5.30 in the morning and uh, go over everything that I've got to do for that morning and get ready. And we have a little bit of breakfast and uh, then drive in and uh, pick uh, uh, pick up some folks. And, and, you know, just I try to get there early so I can make sure that all the electronics is working, all of that kind of stuff. And so... Um, by the time we get done with service and then the class afterwards and, and so forth, well, and then another hour or so driving home, well, we don't get home till about five o'clock in the evening. So we're, we've been out or we've been up in about, you know, 12 hours and uh, it, it just makes for a, a long day. But it's, it's kind of strange in that when I turn off of I-10 to get onto the country road to get back to our place, um, more times than not, I get on to uh, right there. That's the that's the point. When I get off the the off of I ten and turn onto our little country road, there, it's like, uh, wow. Okay, now what am I going to do for next week? What kind of thing can we do for next week? And what's the sermon going to be about next week? And I'm already starting to think about uh, that that next challenge. And and it's not a it's not an onerous thing. It's more of a um, um, pep. I mean, it, it's a, you know, it's, it's something that lifts me up actually to be going Rabbi, back. Rabbi, uh, uh, yes. you know, I was, I was thinking because the, the word for rest used, uh, you're quoting, uh, in the section, uh, 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 Psalm 95, of course, that, that word for rest is minacha and which really actually embodies more than just, than just, uh, 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 uh a rest of sensation of activity. It's it's. I mean, you can be in the rest of God. You can you can appropriate God's rest, uh, just being in the center of His will. You mean um, going through times of tremendous turmoil? You can still be in the rest of God, uh, just simply because of what He. he he has done because I because we've ceased from our works. We've ceased mm -hmm. from, from from what you know what we're it's not it's not us, it's because of what he's done. And um and so we really receive our rest from him. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of funny. I was uh, reading earlier in the week, um going through this book of the uh, um Hebrews through a Hebrews eyes by uh, uh, Dr. Stuart Sachs. And um, he had something to say um, in that uh, he commented that, that God ceased 
from his work and gave the seventh day as an eternal marker, uh, the showing that not by works, but by faith, one could come enter into his completed work. Um, you know, it's one of those things that uh, uh, the Sabbath has been a marker for God's people since creation. And um, so um, when, when uh, Moses wrote the, the Genesis narrative, you know, all the other days when he went to, you know, day one, day two, all the way through six, he said that that, and it was evening and and morning of the whatever day, uh, the evening and morning of the first day, evening and morning of the second day. When he got to this to uh, Shabbat, the seventh day, there was no saying in there. Okay, it was not, uh, you know, that there was, the, and it was the evening and the morning of the seventh day. No, it's just that the seventh day and God rested. Well, in Judaism, we typically um, finish off the the Shabbat with a, a little uh, observance that we call Habdala. And uh, in that, you know, you light a candle and and there's some uh, blessings and prayers that uh, that you do. And you pour a, a, a big uh, cup of wine and uh, we pass around a, a little, little thing that's so, uh, you know, a little receptacle that it's full of uh, spices like allspice and cloves and cinnamon and and things like that and you pass it around to everyone that's in the in the um house with you and what it does it um reminds us of the sweetness of shabbat and how that even though it was a busy day for us it's just the the sweetness of god's rest for us and that's called Havdalah. And but um, the, uh, this uh, this thing here with, uh, with uh, Stuart Sachs, there's, he said that the uh, it doesn't record an ending for the seventh day, and so that me it kind of reveals that okay, creation was finished, and yet it's still open. And the there's an unending blessedness for all who would trustingly receive God's invitation. And so um, we would typically mark the end of the holy day of Shabbat and the beginning of the common weekdays. But we can also enjoy the blessings of God's rest all the way through the week, even though it's our work week and it's the the common and, and you know this it's the difference between the sacred and the profane, not uh, mean profane, not meaning uh, evil or anything like that, but just not holy. And um, I just thought that was a that was kind of, I enjoyed reading that that uh, yeah God said creation was finished. I'm taking a rest, but I'm not going to close it off to say that you can no longer rest that we can still enjoy his blessings and his restfulness all the way through the week as we need it and as we have to have it. So, um, and, uh, you know, there's another, there's a, uh, in Ephesians 1, 3, it says, blessed be the God and father of your Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah. So I just thought that was kind of uh, um, kind of interesting, and um, the the idea that this rest that uh, that uh, he was talking about was um, um, that it's it's not finished yet, you know, and it and uh, it's there for us. And he says, now some of you seem to have <coughs> fallen short. What he's he's again alluding to is that these people are um, they're at a point in their in their walk with the Lord where there's lots of stuff going on, and I think that possibly they can see that there's going to be a looming war or troubles with Rome, 
and so forth. And so then the the believers may be may have been kind of coming under a little bit of attack uh, from all all sorts of places, and they were tempted to uh, just fall back into Judaism and denying their walk with Yeshua as being the Messiah. And that's what he's trying to warn them uh, against. And that's that's something that um, we see in the Messianic movement today. Those of you that maybe have been around it uh, uh, for a while, you see people that get into it and they are just so enamored of all things Jewish. And they like the liturgy and the lighting the candles and and wearing a kippah and, and uh, the zit seat and all of those things that uh, that that these people do, even though they're not Jewish. Uh, but then they decide, well, that's what I really want, and I want to get into that Jewish stuff. And so they do that, and actually I've seen that where they get so far into it that they deny the deity of Yeshua and just uh, just, you know, basically... Uh, go a step away from from uh, Yeshua totally, which is a real, real shame. It's it's just uh, it's just a horrible thing, and I and I've seen it several times, sadly enough. But um, anyway, uh, comments or questions on on that? Uh, okay, so uh, for verse two. For we have, for we also have had good news proclaimed to us, just not as they did, or just as they did, but the word they heard did not help them because they were not unified with those who listened in faith. All right, so this is a little confusing, I guess. Uh, so what uh, what good news are they talking about? Uh, that certainly back in the Old Testament days. There was not the good news of Yeshua, who was born in Bethlehem of a virgin, and 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 uh, you know died and lived a perfect life, and uh, died on the cross, and rose again after three days, and now sits on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. They didn't have that good news. Okay, they had things that were proclaimed of the goodness of God, the promises of God. But it was an incomplete picture, okay? Because the the um, uh, revelation of God has been progressive all the way from the beginning of the Bible on down through the Book of Revelation, and so they they had something, and yet uh, the the writer here is saying that look, you've had the good news proclaimed to you just like they did back in the day and yet it didn't help them and so uh, you know the what was the good news that maybe uh, the ancient israelites had well the good news was that god said i'm making a covenant with you and if you will obey my words and do what i command you to do i will bless you so abundantly i'll just bless your socks off even though they didn't wear socks but anyway i just Bless your sandals off. And that was that was good news. I mean, all they had to do, he says, I will you I'll bring you into the promised land and I'll give you everything from the uh um uh, the the river of uh, of um Egypt, which is that Wadi Al something or another that runs from Elat up to the southern uh, part of Gaza today, all the way up to the Euphrates. And so that's that's your that's going to be your land. You can have it all, and if you just obey me. And wow, that's pretty good news, especially to a people that had been slaves in Egypt for uh, several generations. So, uh, and you, Rabbi, yes, I, I was thinking also the other aspect of this is, uh, was the unbelief. They they uh, you know Joshua and they, Caleb went in. And they spied the land and they came back and said, "Hey, yeah, yes, you know." And, uh, there's ten spies that that that, mm -hmm. uh, 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 that and you know, it's only Joshua and, and, and Caleb said that. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, they, these guys say these guys are like giants, but he said we can take them. You know, we have you know, I we, they had the faith that that they could do it. They could, you know, that, that God God promised this to us. All we have to do is believe God, trust God, and. 
and he's going to give it to, give it to us. And the, the result of uh, the people uh, being fearful and not wanting to go in was the fact that they had to walk for 40 years in the desert. That entire generation died. Sure. So you know, sure. so oh, it's only Joshua and Caleb who went in. It was, and it was purely because of unbelief, because they did not they did not believe what would and would not believe what God had promised. Yeah, and then what happened when they went into the land then, um, and uh, uh, Caleb told Joshua, said, look, now remember what I asked for and what was promised to me. I want Hebron, and I want the land around Hebron. And uh, um, he says, even though I'm 85 years old, I am still well able to take that mountain. And it was known to be inhabited by a race or a group, a family or whatever, of uh, very, very large men. They called them giants. And when uh, Joshua said, yep, that's right, you get to have uh, Hebron. Well, once uh, Caleb marched on Hebron, the giants took off, wouldn't even fight him. They took off and went to Gaza. And uh, so, yeah, he took that He took that land and it just took faith because Caleb, uh, Caleb God said he was a different spirit. He had a different spirit. And that was one. He trusted God. And so, um, you know, there was other good news. Uh, uh, the Lord uh, spoke to Moses, I mean, uh, to uh, Abraham and said, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. You find that in uh, Genesis 12. And so that, uh, so that they, you know, Abraham was to foresee that the Gentiles would be brought into faith and and that uh, all the nations would be blessed. And so Abraham put his trust in the Lord and the Lord uh, reckoned that to be righteousness for him. And so there are, you know, there are other uh, aspects of that, of the good news. Uh, God gave, uh, gave King David a hint at a future Messiah in uh, 2 Samuel and 7, 19. He says, yet this was a small thing in your eyes, my Lord Adonai, for you have spoken also of your servant's house for the distant future. And this is a revelation for humanity, my Lord Adonai. So that's where God had told him, he says, I'm going to put somebody on your throne. And he'll be, uh, for, uh, and your your uh, kingdom will last forever. So he got kind of a glimpse. He didn't get the whole thing. And, uh, you know, he didn't realize that uh, uh, the Messiah was going to be born in his hometown, but uh, uh, he believed it. And, and so... Uh, um, Later on in the book of Hebrews, uh, in uh, chapter 11, 26, that's where Moses, uh, the author said of Moses that, that he considered the disgrace of Messiah as greater riches than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to the reward. And so there, somehow, some way, God had revealed to Moses that there was going to be a Messiah and that he was going to come for uh, God's people. And so he was he was looking for that. But because of unbelief, like Warren had said, these guys rejected that, that whole generation, basically a generation of slaves. They, they rejected God's plan for them and, and they just didn't have the faith to believe that, that, uh, that God was going to do all of that for them. And so as a result, they were not able to enter into the um, the land. And so these these ancients had seen several you know messages from God. They didn't have enough faith to follow through and obtain the promises um, and the and the blessings. And the author here, the writer of Hebrews, is saying, he doesn't want his audience to suffer this same fate. So going ahead, verse three. For we who have trusted are entering into that rest. It is just as God has said, so in my wrath I swore they will never enter my rest, even though his works were finished since the foundation of the world. So the uh, the author of, of Hebrews says that 
only we who believe can enter into God's rest. Okay, that, that makes sense. We believe that. Uh, and uh, back in chapter three, he uh, he appealed, uh, you know, he, he, he quoted Psalm 95 and, uh, and talked about the severity uh, of what happened to the ancient Israelites not having faith in the Lord. And they they failed to enter into the promised land. They couldn't go into that that rest. One of the commentators that I, I read here, uh, David De Silva, he indicated that this repetitive uh, use or recontextualization—that's uh, re his word—of Psalm ninety five eleven uh, allows entering God's rest to saturate the hearers' minds replacing any contrary or competing agendas they may have brought to the hearing of this sermon. So he said, yeah, the the writer is is hitting on Psalm 95 again and again to get the idea of this rest for God's people if they will only stay firm in in the walking with the Lord. And so uh Hebrews 3, the third chapter, was a quotation from Psalm 95. It was a warning against not hearing what the Lord had and you know, just hardening their hearts. And now it's used as a warning not to give up on the rest that he offers those who have faith in him. It's a little bit different, different view uh, of it. One was, you know, that uh, uh, don't harden your hearts. You got to listen to what the Lord says. And the other was, okay, you've listened. Now don't give up. Stay with it. Stay strong. So, um, so really, while the rest of uh, the rest that is in the Lord is something that uh, is available in His coming kingdom in the millennium, it's also something that, uh, to a wide degree, can be present you know, a present reality in the lives of men and women today and to that time in uh, uh, at the time of the writing of Hebrews. Uh, the Greek that's used here indicates that a possible translation could be um, more of a fluid thing of we are entering that rest. It's not like, okay, we have arrived. No, this one, as we are entering into that rest, more of a journey rather than a destination. And so uh, this is not just something that believers are to partake of as part of their faith in Yeshua, but we're in the process of entering into. And so they, uh, they're in the process of entering such a rest. And so there, there remains the possibility that they can leave that state. And while, while they can ex experience a, a state of, of uh, this, um, uh, the end time rest, you know, they, they on their lives, and they can understand that that the future realities of that. But there's also a current, this day world living today rest that can be part of theirs, and you know, it's it's uh, something that, yeah, are they going to have the full rest of the Lord? You know, at right now, no. Um, that will be in the, in the future. And the only time that they're going to have full rest in the Lord now is to die. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm well, you know, I would like to go, uh, be with the Lord and, and all of that kind of stuff, but, uh, I, I'm not ready to board that train like tonight. You know, I, I've got things that, uh, to do, and I, I'd, I'd like to keep on doing it for a while. So, Rabbi, um, you. I, you got you got me thinking about the fact that um, you know we are called to live the abundant life in Messiah, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So that and um, and there's an aspect of of the kingdom of God. I mean, we are we've been translated into His kingdom. We've been tra translated from the kingdom of this world into the uh, into, into the kingdom of, of, of uh, His beloved Son, right? So we are. So we. We manifest, we are a manifestation of the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is kind of like a now, but not yet. Yes. I mean, we are, we are, we are, we are experiencing it now, but we, it's not, it's not, 
come into its fullness. We can't experience it in its fullness until until we're there. And so, so I think it kind of correlates with this whole concept of milcha of 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 rest in yeah. in in Messiah. Yep. Good point. Good point. So you know this, uh, and the thing about it is, God's rest was denied to that faithless generation coming out of Egypt. Okay. But his rest had always been there, even from the beginning of the world, from the creation of the world, God's rest was available to his people in part. And uh, so this present generation, the generation of Hebrews, all the way down to uh, those of us today, that rest is available and has been available since the creation of the world. Uh, you know, if we accept Yeshua today and follow his words, there's going to be a physical rest for us, you know, in this in this temporal world, and then also a a future rest in the in the millennial period that uh, will be far superior to what we're seeing now, of course. But uh, um, that's when you'll really see the the uh, the rest um, that is that is uh, given by the Lord. All right. Um, Verses four and five. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall never enter my rest. Okay, so uh, yeah, is that a little bit of whiplash there? Well, no, not really. This was a a common uh, Hebraic, uh, well, what I call it there, a literary tool where they're talking about, well, it's uh, written someplace and it's, and it's, um, uh, it's kind of hard for us to fathom this kind of, of a literary tool because uh, what we'll say a lot of times is, well, the Bible says that. And uh, I always, uh, when somebody tells me that, says that to me, I always say, where does it say that? Give me a verse and a, you know, chapter and verse of where the Bible says that. Well, I don't know, especially the more outlandish something is that somebody's trying to, uh, uh, you know, some some uh, uh, point that they're trying to make, the more outlandish it is. Uh, and they say, well, the Bible says, okay, where does it say that? Give me ver uh, chapter and verse. Uh, and uh, that, that normally kind of uh, stems the flow of, uh, of silliness uh, when somebody can't, you know, quote, but this was a, um, a literary tool that was very common in Jewish writing. And only because when he says, well, it was spoken. Uh, and again, what we talked about last week is that they didn't have chapter, they didn't have book chapter and verses there, you know, like, like we do today. So it would be kind of hard for them to say, okay, in your Torah scroll, if you scroll over to the the seventeenth uh, column and about halfway down. No, they just uh, they started memorizing Torah when they're three years old, so they knew what was in it. And so now he's saying, "Okay, somewhere it's it's spoken, or you know, it is spoken uh, as in this way." And God rested uh, on the seventh day, and that's uh, that would be in uh, I think in the uh, uh, third third chapter of uh, Genesis, what we call Genesis today. And um, so, I mean, his his audience would have known this. This is uh, something that uh, it was not new to them. This, And they would look at him and he'd say, what, you know, where, do, where do, would it say something like that about this seventh day? Of course, they knew about the seventh day because they had been living the seventh day all of their lives and the generations before them from uh, from the days of Moses and before. So th that was, again, that was just something he was bringing back to their memory, something that, uh, and and I, I said there that it was very familiar to them and to the point where it was maybe too familiar in that Shabbat had ceased to take on that special quality that God was trying to, instill in their hearts that Shabbat was a special day. That's why it's so important for us uh, as 
well, in, in Jewish homes anyway, and a lot of uh, uh, Gentiles, non-Jewish folks that uh, are in the Messianic movement today, they will have the candle lighting. And it's, of course, it's a, it's a man-made tradition. It's not anywhere in the Bible about lighting two candles and saying the, uh, the blessing for lighting of the candles and, and, you know, the, the deal where the woman uh, you know, does this uh, three times and closes her eyes and, you know, all of that kind of stuff that, that we do every, uh, every Friday night. Uh, but that's important because it sets the tone and, uh, you know, we, we, we get, uh, cleaned up, we get dressed in, in clean clothes for uh, Shabbat, uh, at night. And, uh, uh, you know, you'll have maybe some special foods for that night. And, um, it, it sets apart that special day of Shabbat. And I think that's that's an important thing for us to do. And um, then, of course, the uh, the uh, Havdalah the next day at the end of Shabbat, uh, again, sets boundaries, sets, uh, you know, a beginning and an end for Shabbat. And that way we don't forget and, and we don't let Shabbat be a common day where we just, okay, that's just like any other day. And I'll uh, just keep on working or I'll keep on doing whatever it is that I do. And, uh, you know, it's just something that we've determined that uh, we're very, very careful about, you know, when I, when I get home and I got lots of stuff to do, well, the only stuff that I'm going to do on a Shabbat when I get home is I'll get my, my stuff together and I'll, I'll be studying the word for either my next class or the the Shabbat the sermon for the next Shabbat or the uh, the uh, class that I have the next uh, the next Shabbat those that's the only kind of thing that uh, that I will uh, participate in even though I look out there and the grass is about this high and I need to cut the grass it'll it'll have to be cut another day so that's why he's bringing out this idea of the Shabbat it's familiar but don't let it become so familiar all right. Um, Rabbi, you know, you're sharing something about the Havdalah, and I was thinking about the, the story in Acts 20 where Eutychus fell out of the window, and 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 it's what that is a picture to me. If you if you read that, they'd spent all day in the synagogue and said, and it was, it said it was the first day of the week, but you know, the first day of the week actually starts at sundown, so. Yeah. So it wasn't like this wasn't Sunday morning when Eutychus fell out, out of the window. This 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 it was, was it this, was like this, late, this late Saturday, Saturday night. night. Yeah, yeah, they 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 had have maybe they had had Havdal or whatever, or, and they, they just like Paul just kept on teaching and teaching and teaching. This poor guy, he's fall he fell asleep oh, and then he falls out of, out of the window. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a common malady. Yeah, Carl. I just want to mention on that particular verse that you just mentioned, it says the first day of the week. And there's about four or five times in the New Testament where that uh, sequence is used. Day isn't there. It's uh, italics in the King James. And the week is not the Greek word for week. It's uh, sabios. In other words, it's first of the Sabbath is what it literally is, and our Bibles translate the first day of the week like it's Sunday, mm. but it's not. You see the same thing at the uh, resurrection uh, on the on on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene. It's exactly the same thing, but that uh, that word for it's not the Greek word for week. It's the word translated Sabbath throughout the New Testament, but it's translated in our English Bibles as first of the week. So everybody thinks it's Sunday, but this is that's that's that sequence is in that passage as well. So uh, that's an idiomatic expression you can find in your Greek lexicon. It means Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, and and that's that's interesting. We're going to have to uh, look that up because I'm not. I was not. No, just go on your Blue Letter Bible, and it's it's there. Yeah. Okay. And I use a uh, I use an inner uh, an interlinear linear. Bible and then also I got this dude in in uh, England that uh, that reads the Greek for me so I know how to pronounce it so that I 
um because i don't know how i'm i've never studied greek uh in any any uh, formal fashion uh like hebrew but uh um, anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up. That's interesting because uh, I'm always having to defend myself uh, on the the Passover week and and how that uh, worked out and and uh, what day it was and and so on and so forth. That uh, you know he was not crucified on the on uh, Friday afternoon and then rose from the dead. Uh, you know uh, something like. Uh, what 24 36 hours later that's not three days and three nights you know so um anyway there's there's always that so all right good deal um but anyway there uh the writer here did warn them that not everyone is going to enter into god's rest because some people are just not gonna they're they're not gonna stay on the path they're gonna fall off the wagon and and uh, they're just they they're not going to enter into God's rest. So it's uh, it is interesting. Uh, some of the commentaries that I was uh, reading for this week on um, it's hard to find messianic commentary uh, commentaries because the movement hasn't been around in any form or fashion except uh, you know since late sixties early seventies. So to develop the scholarship that uh, um, that say Christianity has had, where there's been two thousand years of people writing stuff, um, it's a little hard. And then the, some of these guys that uh, uh, some of them I've, I've actually some of these commentators I've actually met at seminars and stuff like that, and they uh, and you know they are so thoroughly um replacement theology guys that you know some of the stuff they say is okay but boy then they just they they can't help it but uh it, then drop over into that stuff and so then we see that the lord has transferred his blessings over to the christians and in uh and left the jews behind because they rejected the lord and you know that's that's uh silliness but um uh, <laughs> And it's out there and I have to, I have to cull through some of that stuff. Sometimes it's interesting. All right. I hear you. Uh, huh? I hear you. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, okay. Verse six and seven said, so it remains for some to enter into it. Yet those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of disobedience. Again, God appoints a certain day today, uh, uh, saying through David after so long a time, just as that had been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And I always think of that movie that, you know, today, Junior. And uh, um, that's that's the thing. Today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but right now in the present is when you must... Um, you know, be walking with the Lord. You can't say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow may never come. So um, the good news was, as we talked about before, had been proclaimed to, you know, to everybody in, in Israel. They had some good news. They knew it wasn't the whole thing yet, but they didn't act on the, the good news that they had. And so, um, but not all of the people lost their their uh, um, time with the Lord. I mean, their their uh, their opportunity to get into the rest of God. Uh, some made it, some didn't, because some believed and some didn't. And um, in in David's day, God re-extended His offer of entering rest, and uh, and His David's generation had to respond for itself. Each generation has to respond for itself. And so um, they they had their today. You know, it's we have our today. Every generation has had their today. And so it's so important that uh, we take that opportunity, accept the Lord today and not put it off uh, you know for another another time because we just don't have a promise of where there's no guarantee 
of another time. Every morning when I wake up and I thank the Lord that he's resurrected me from, from uh, the, the sleep. For me, it's the sleep of the dead because when I go to sleep, man, I'm out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's called the Modea Ni. And so I get up in the morning and I thank God for, for bringing me again to the right side of the grass when I'm up. And uh, so that's that's why we have to stay with this, uh, you know, the idea of today is the day of salvation. All right, um, eight through 11. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered God's rest has also ceased from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make it, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. So the, um, the prospect of rest for the Israelites, uh, specifically the, the possession of the promised land, that's what they, okay, you're going to go into the land, you're going to have rest and the full blessing of that. Um, it, it, you know, it didn't happen when Joshua defeated the Canaanites. Why? Well, because he, they didn't defeat all the Canaanites. They did not go in and um, conquer all of the land that God had promised to them. And they, they made compromises with the people that were there. They got tricked by some of the people that were there. And so they did not cleanse the land, as it were. And as a result... We still have problems today uh, from people that should not have been allowed to even exist in the land. God told them to either drive them out of the land, uh, or if they will not leave, then they're under, under ban, they're under judgment, and uh, you are to exterminate them. But he said, drive them out first, and if they won't go, then they're uh, you need to uh, uh, kill them. And so um, the author here is saying that uh, that uh, God's promise of rest did not and does not have merely an earthly fulfillment, but is uh, it's it also has that end time, the eschatological uh, aspect of it. And uh, so we still await as people of God for the fullness. We just can't get that that fullness yet until the end time. So the uh, <clears throat> the Sabbath rest uh, in view here is the rest or the full inheritance that every generation of believers and every individual believer enters into when he or she, like God did at creation, faithfully finish his or her work, okay? And so uh, that's what I was talking about, that uh, um, the idea of the Shabbat rest, when we finish our, our, our work for the, for the week and we set aside the time just to rest in the Lord. And, uh, you know, those of us who are believers will enter into our rest if we've persevered in the faith, when we receive our inheritance from Yeshua at the uh, at His judgment seat, so the millennial rest in the promised land will be the portion of Israel in the future. Okay, they're going to have that land, that land that God promised to them from the uh, the Wadi Al Wadi uh, down at uh, at the bottom of Israel, which is basically the southern border of, of uh, Israel right now. Um, uh, up to said to the Euphrates, so that's going to encompass a whole bunch of, of all of Lebanon and um, all the you know a bunch of Syria up up in there. That's going to be Israel's land. So um, the um, you know, now there's a guy Walter Kaiser that uh, he he's a theologian and author that. I've I've actually met him and eaten uh, uh, lunch with him a couple of times, and he he interpreted this this uh, rest 
as just strictly in the future, that there's not not a, a rest today, but it's all in the future. And so he, he believed that first Israel and then all the believers would fulfill this promise um, of possessing the promised land in the millennium period. And that's when the rest will come. But, um, you know, it, the, the uh, passage also seems to be referring to an eternal rest for all believers and uh, which, you know, the, the millennium is just the beginning and Israel will be the primary people that God blesses and, and, and makes a blessing in the millennium. And so um, this, uh, this Sabbath that we have today, it's just incomplete. The Sabbath rest that we have today is good and it's fulfilling, but it's incomplete and it won't be completed until the, the millennial period. Um, Rabbi, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with you that uh, it's incomplete. I mean, but uh, I say that entirely in the future. I, I couldn't see because it, it says, "For the one who has entered his rest yeah, has yeah. himself also rested from his works." That's telling me that <laughs> it's something that we can appropriate now. Absolutely, I mean, we may not experience yeah. the fullness of it, but yeah. we cer certainly can appropriate. Well, I guarantee you that uh, when you uh, when you think about it and and just put you know put aside and just say you know to the Lord, okay, I am resting now in your in your rest, and it is a blessed rest. I can I can tell you I can assure you of that. That you know when I come home from Shabbat, okay, am I tired? Absolutely. Am I wiped out? Yes, I am. But there's something good about it, and and so. Uh, sometimes I can just sit out here on the back porch swing and uh, um, just just enjoy the blessings of uh, you know the rest that that God gives us. And it's sure it's a it's a rest today also. And uh, um, it's it's just uh, it's 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 kind of hard to explain really when you when you get right down to it, but. If we finish our work and then rest in the Lord, it's a blessed rest. It's a it's a blessing, and uh, I don't know how I'm going to finish the rest of before eleven of before eight o'clock. But anyway, um, so in the meantime, before we enter our rest, we need to follow Yeshua and Moses' examples of faithfulness to God. Be faithful, carry out the work that He's given us to do, whether it's. Uh, uh, being uh, uh, an electrician or uh, whatever. Jerry, yeah, you see your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was taking a drink of water, but just a fun fact. I don't mean to throw you off, but uh, you no. mentioned Walter, Walter Kaiser. He came to our church in Cleveland back in the 70s for a week of meetings. I was enthralled to get to know him. And I still remember him talking about interpreting the Bible. And, uh, you know, in the, in the culture, in the, whatever he's trying to say, because if you say that you interpret it literally and you read that God uh, cut, is, cuddles his uh, flock, uh, does that mean he's a chicken? And uh, and I, I remember that, that it's not. He wasn't, <laughs> obviously, he just was using that, sure. that phrase. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. No, that's all right. No, uh, Walter Kaiser was uh, quite the theologian and just a, a delightful man to be around. Uh, uh, I can remember one lunch that uh, we sat around and we didn't talk Bible at all. We talked about cows and chickens and goats and uh, corn growing and because he had a farm and and that's all we talked about was different agriculture. And it was it was definitely enjoyable. <laughs> so he's yeah, he's, he's a good guy. Good guy to be around. OK, Um all right, let's let's go ahead with this twelve and thirteen here. I know we're we're kind of running through it. Uh, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing right through to a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from Him, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Okay, the Word of God. Uh, the author is is now he's he's going to Scripture as his authority for his thesis thus far. Okay, he's he's been saying a lot of things, but he said 
All of this is by the word of God. He's speaking to his audience who they write, you know, he's kind of preaching to the choir because they agreed that uh, the of the truth in, in uh, the scripture, the veracity of, of scripture. And so the word of God here, when they talk about the word of God, it's not referring to Yeshua, uh, but to actual scriptures. Now, during the, the period from uh, uh, the 2000 years, there was a time where the teaching was that the word of God here was Yeshua. But uh, I think, uh, um, I think beginning with Calvin and maybe some others that that's, that sort of stuff has been uh, laid to rest and everybody thinks, says, no, no, he's talking about the words in the scripture, the actual scripture. So um, after, uh, you know, after we die or some point after the Messiah returns to earth at the beginning of the, the, the uh, millennial uh, period, God is going to do a spiritual postmortem uh, <laughs> on us. And uh, he's going to examine all of our, you know, innermost, innermost attitudes and motives. And uh, so what's he going to use as the judge? The judgment, his scalpel, he'll be using the word, okay? And uh, uh, it's the written word of God. And so- uh, Rav, Rav, can, I, can I just briefly interject here? So the fact that I found that the word of God, when it says it's a, a two-edged sword, I've experienced that in my own life because, you know, the, the, the thing about it is, is that you can be using it for a specific application or to be speak or sharing with others. But the two-edged sword, you can some very often you yourself are cut by it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever had a paper cut, but you get a paper cut and it, that hurts. You get a paper cut that, that goes deep. And you know what? That that kind of paper cut doesn't even compare to the paper cut that you get oh, yeah. from the word of God. That's exactly right. Yes, indeed. Now, what I, I did give you, leave you a picture of the uh, of the sword that they're talking about, what they were talking about here. And it doesn't really show it, but some of the, the models they had, this this old, uh, this is a, an actual sword here. And it was, uh, this side was a cutting edge, but then on this top side, it also had a cutting edge in some, uh, some of the swords. And so um, I'm told that the original, it was, uh, uh, um, it's I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's uh, the two-edged sword here was the is a uh, Macaran, uh, Macaran, uh, and it was originally a small, more like a knife, a boning knife that cooks would use to cut up meat. And so, uh, in the 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 double-edged form, it it became symbolic for judges and magistrates in the Roman world. So this was this was something that was. Uh, known to his audience that, okay, here's the symbol. Here's what the judges and all those magistrates, they talk about the sword cuts both ways. And uh, it illustrated the power of those officials to turn both ways to get to the bottom of a case. And so by the time that this was written in Hebrews, uh, this Makera um, sword had become, you know, it, it basically uh, came to be a sword of any size, short or long, and uh, um, the the writer pictured his sword as a as a devouring beast. God's sword as a, a devouring beast. So, um, anyway, that's uh, um, the the Jews always regarded a word not as a sound but as a power. Remember, it was the word that created the world. It was the word that they uh, heard at Mount Sinai. They didn't see uh, a physical picture of God. They just heard his voice. And so um, it's that word that when we're compared to what God says about us and for us, uh, it's a it's a hard uh, it, it's hard to uh, uh, to uh, kick against that. That's for sure. All right. Um, and um, I think uh, sometimes they would say that this uh, this deal, some believers 
or use this verse that we just had that to show that God is going to judge unbelievers with his piercing word. But in context here, I think uh, the writer here is referring to God judging believers in order to determine our rewards. You know, that uh, um, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, uh, through 15, for no one can lay any other foundation than what it is already laid, which is Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, Yeshua, with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed by fire, and the fire itself will test each one's work, what sort it is. If someone's work is built uh, on the foundations, if someone's, if anyone's work built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but as through fire. All right, so um, <laughs> every believer is going to be judged, and our works will be judged. And so um, uh, the thing about it is we need to stay faithful to the Lord and uh, and not, not be frivolous. I think that's a lot of things that... Uh, we see um, people in in uh, well in the church world and our synagogue and that sort of stuff that um, you know they get into all sorts of foolishness and my goodness you wouldn't believe uh, some of the the questions that I have to answer sometimes. Let's go on. Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol the, who has passed through the heavens. Yeshua ben Elohim, let us hold firmly to our confessed allegiance, for we do not have a Kohen Gadol who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the same ways, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near to the grace of uh, the throne of grace with boldness so that we can receive uh, mercy and find grace for help in time of need. So, from verse 14 here onward, all throughout uh, through chapter nine, actually, the author, he begins a series of, you know, on again, off again, references to Yeshua, the Messiah as the high priest. And so um, we can see that this is kind of a, an expansion uh, of uh, Psalms, uh, Psalms 110 and four says, Adonai has sworn and will not relent you are a Kohen forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So Yeshua functions as high priest in heaven in a position and role that is superior to that of Aaron, not the same priesthood, okay? Yeshua didn't become a priest like Aaron. He became a heavenly priest. His shoes, uh, you know, uh, so the... Um, his 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 high priestly ministry is the guarantee that God's people will celebrate um, Shabbat in His presence. Okay, and so our great high priest has already proved faithful through suffering. He's now in God's presence, where He intercedes for us, and He's not like the earthly priests, you know, because. Um, uh, and he's our he's our leader, and and we will follow him through the heavens to our father's house one day. I mean, he he's he's the one that we follow, and so this great high priest is none other than Yeshua. He is he's not an angel. He's the high priest, and he's also king, to both things, king and high priest, which um, could not happen during the time on earth. Uh, God would never allow the kings to be the high priest or the priest high priest to then become the kings. No, no, you you can't do that. You had to have separation of powers. And so this picture of Yeshua as the high priest is probably the most distinctive theme of Hebrews. And it's it's central to the theology of, of the book. And so uh couple things here. Notice that the verse does not say that since we have such a high priest, we will inevitably hold fast our confession. No, it says, uh, since we do have such a high priest, 
make sure that you hold on to your your uh, profession of faith and that uh, you persevere. Um, to 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we, endure, in, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So um, since we have such a high priest, we must be careful to hold fast our confession. And uh, um, so this verse concludes, you know, with that uh, exhortation to enter into his rest that that uh, began back in in chapter uh, uh, chapter um, three. So um, I think uh, Yeshua, in his role as a high priest, is superior to any earthly high priest because he lived a life on earth without sin. He was tempted, the Bible says, in every way that we uh, that we are, but whereas we often succumb to the temptations, Yeshua never did. And now he sits at the right hand of God as we as believers have the privilege of coming to him with our needs, our wants, uh, sometimes, and, and uh, just, you know, we can come like a child coming to his father. You know, you're if you, those of you that have had children, you know how that uh, uh, you just never, uh, when your kids come to you with with something that they really need, or sometimes even things that you, they they just want, uh, you know, you don't kick them out of the way. You you kind of you listen to them, and then you make a decision as to what uh, you know whether they uh, they really do need that. Uh, that car when they're 16 years old um, or something like that, you know, um, you know, instead of the high powered car, I know what I got a 1947 GMC pickup that cost $125. And I drove the wheels off of that rascal. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my dad, you know, he provided and that got me to school and back and, uh, and more, we had some good times with it. But we can come to the Father through Yeshua that same way because we are his children. And with that, thank you, Lord. Uh, <laughs> with that, yeah, uh, Carl, you had. Yeah, I just, uh, one way of getting one's brain wrapped around this is there's a heavenly tabernacle, just like there was an earthly tabernacle. And Yeshua could not be the high priest in the earthly tabernacle because he was not a Levite. Right. But in the heavenly tabernacle, that's not a requirement. So he is high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. So uh, that's that's how he yep. can work this out. Both ways. Yes. Yeah, yeah both, both ways. Yeah, because we're talking about a heavenly position um, and where he's a you know, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And, and he's also our high priest. And, and uh, that's um, that's how we gain our atonement is through him. So good deal. All right. Let me go ahead and I'm going to uh, shut the uh, recording off and then we'll open it up if anybody's got uh, 